jump into the passage of Scripture this evening and study this text together. We are in Exodus chapter 12, Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 28. We are continuing to look at these passages with this thought in mind that in these plagues, in these works that God is performing there in Egypt in these days, these are demonstrations of sovereignty. These are demonstrations of sovereignty. God is showing, he's proclaiming to the world uh, his sovereignty, that he is king over all. He is humiliating the gods of Egypt. He's humiliating the false gods that they worship. In fact, he says in this chapter, and I will execute all my judgments on the gods of Egypt. It is not the gods of Egypt who have kept Israel in Egypt. It is not the gods of Egypt who will keep Israel in Egypt. And it's not the gods of Egypt who will deliver Egypt from the God of Israel. The God of Israel is the only one who is active here. He is the only one who is powerful here. He's the only one who can save. He's the only one who can truly execute his wrath. And so he does that. He executes his wrath, and he also demonstrates his grace. That's what we saw in the previous text, Exodus chapter 11, verse 1 through 10. We saw that God demonstrates his sovereignty by both grace and wrath. That God chooses to do this, and God does it perfectly. God does it wisely. Now, there's a bit of a a parenthetical um, passage here. It is the institution of the Passover. It is the institution of the Passover. And in the giving of the Passover, or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, God is demonstrating his sovereignty. God is the one who is able to assign the means of deliverance. God assigns the means of deliverance. He designs the means of deliverance. And he offers the means of deliverance to those whom he chooses. What you will find absent in this passage is this offer given to Egypt to observe the Passover and be spared the judgment. They have already been called into compliance and they rebelled against that call. Their leader rebelled against that call. They are not given the opportunity for redemption. They are not given the opportunity for salvation. And God is not obligated to give them that opportunity, nor is he wrong for not giving them that opportunity. In fact, he is justified in bringing about exactly what he promised from the very beginning. Pharaoh, let my firstborn son go. And if you will not let my firstborn son go, I will kill your firstborn son. The Lord promised that to Pharaoh and all of Egypt before he ever brought about a single plague. And even with that knowledge, even with that word coming from Jehovah, Pharaoh said, well, who is Yahweh that I should listen to him? Who is he? What what, what authority does he have? Well, it just so happens he has authority over the waters. He has authority over the insects. He has authority over the amphibians. He has authority over the hail, over the lightning, over the fire. He has authority to wipe out all your crops. He has authority over light and darkness. He has authority over disease and death. And he has the authority to take life. He has the authority to give life. He has the authority to spare life. Who is God that I should serve him? Who is God that I should fear him? Well, this is who he is. The first thing that Pharaoh is going to learn about God is that God is sovereign, that God is king, not Pharaoh. So here in this passage, it's a very, very interesting passage. In fact, it's a foundational passage for the remainder of all the Bible. It's a foundational passage for understanding even what Jesus did for us. So we look here this evening at God's demonstration of sovereignty and looking specifically at the Passover. 
I want to draw for you three observations from this passage, three observations about the manner in which God spares his people or how God spares his people, three observations about that. I don't want to chase a ton of connected veins here in this passage. There is the opportunity to preach for many hours from this passage alone because there are so many veins that are traced out through the rest of Scripture. I don't want to trace out those veins. I want to preach this passage. Okay, and we'll trace out those veins as we walk through the rest of Scripture. And this passage is touched by those passages. But this evening, I want to look at this passage really in five sections. And at the very end, we'll draw out those three observations. And I'm going to teach you some truths about the Passover, what the Passover was all about. In verse 1 through 7, you see that the Passover was a meal of sacrifice. The Passover was a meal of sacrifice. In verse 8 through 11, you see that the Passover was a meal of preparation. It's a meal of preparation. In verse 12 through 13, you see that the Passover was a meal of substitution. A meal of substitution. In verse 14 through 20, you see the Passover was a meal of remembrance. A meal of remembrance. And in verse 21 through 28, the Passover was a meal of proclamation. A meal of proclamation. So the Passover is a meal of sacrifice, preparation, substitution, remembrance, proclamation. And if you think of the Passover in those terms, which are accurately reflective of the essence and the extent of the passage, if you think of the Passover in those terms, and then you at the same time think of the Lord's Supper, you think of the Lord's Supper, you begin to see those glaring parallels. So that's what the Lord's Supper is, isn't it? You could say this, Brother Jim, the Lord's Supper is a meal of sacrifice. The Lord's Supper is a meal of preparation. The Lord's Supper is a meal of substitution. The Lord's Supper is a meal of remembrance. The Lord's Supper is a meal of proclamation. You say all the same things, all the same things. Indeed, what the Passover does, the Passover prepared Egypt or Israel for, for deliverance from Egypt, but the Passover prepares the world for the true Passover lamb, for Jesus. Gives us a means of anticipation and expectation of a greater deliverance. Surely, there's not just a deliverance from bondage in Egypt. You deliver people from bondage in Egypt, they still live and die. Surely there's a greater deliverance. You deliver slaves out of Egypt and they're still sinners. Surely there's a greater deliverance, not just from Egypt, but from the bondage of sin. Not just from slavery, but the bondage of death. Surely there's a greater deliverance. And those questions seemingly are begged in our hearts and then Jesus, in the timing of God, comes onto the scene and offers himself as the true Passover lamb. Just as John said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So let's look at this passage. These three observations I'm gonna draw for you. Let me just go ahead and announce them to you in one clean sentence. Here it is to summarize everything. God spares his people by sacrifice, faith, and grace. God spares his people by sacrifice, faith, and grace. You see each of those three very obviously in this passage. So let's look at verse 1 through 7. The Passover was a meal of sacrifice. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt. So he did not tell this to Moses in Horeb. Moses was at the foot of the mountain. He did not tell him that there. Now the Lord is revealing what Moses needs to know, what Israel needs to know. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, this month shall be for you the beginning of months. 
It shall be the first month of the year for you. We're not going to trace out all the passages connected to this, but just suffice it to say the Bible makes it clear that this month is the month of Abib. The month of Abib. Now, after the times of exile, in the other languages, that month actually comes to be the month of Nisan. So you were to talk about the beginning months for the Jewish calendar, it is the month of Nisan, the month of Abib. This begins the year. It begins the calendar for Israel. It begins the calendar for Israel. They begin their year with an observation of deliverance. Everything starts here for Israel. That God, in fulfillment of his covenant to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, delivers his people. You begin your year here. You begin everything with this truth and with this observation. Verse 3, tell all the congregation of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, every man shall take a lamb according to their father's houses, a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then he and his nearest neighbor shall take according to the number of persons, according to what each can eat. You shall make count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. This is not a meal of waste, and this is really not even a meal so much about eating. This is not a meal of waste. You're not to take a lamb for each household if that household is too small. Gather together, this is not about wasting, this is not about, this is not about the overspilling of blood. This is a meal of remembrance, but this is indeed a meal of sacrifice. You are going to take of what is valuable to you, and of what is valuable to you, you are going to take what is most valuable to you. And you're going to get real personal with it. So you're gonna go out into the flocks on the 10th day of the first month, and you're going to find for each household one male lamb from the lambs or from the goats, from the sheep or from the goats, one male lamb, and that lamb has got to be without blemish. It can't have a split ear, it can't have an off color to it, it can't have any deformity, any defect. It has to be without blemish. It has to be of the utmost value. And you're to take that lamb, that one-year-old lamb, and you're to keep it until the 14th day. What does it mean to take that lamb from the flock and keep it till the 14th day? It means take it to your house. You're going to get really familiar. You're going to get really personal. You're going to know this lamb. You're going to go and keep this lamb in your house, next to your house, and you're going to take care, special care, of that lamb. This sacrifice is going to be costly to you of what's most valuable to you, of what's personal to you, of what you care for, of what you become attached for. Can you imagine the children? Here they have this perfect, beautiful lamb in their home, and that lamb comes in and is staying with them for four full days. And this never happens. You keep the lambs outside of the house. You keep them out with the rest of the flock. No, you're going to bring those lambs into your home. Keep it until the 14th day, verse 6, when the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill, they shall slaughter their lambs at twilight. As the night is coming, as sunlight is fading, everyone is going to go and they're going to slaughter their lambs at the same time. Everybody there, everybody in the household, everybody watching. Then this is what you do. And they shall take some of the blood, verse seven, and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. Quite a gruesome picture. Here is this slaughtering of a sacrifice right there in front of the whole family. Going to catch all of the blood in a bucket, in a pan, in a pail. And they're going to keep that blood. 
Not only are they going to kill that lamb and skin it, they're going to then take it inside of the home and they're gonna take the blood and they're gonna take the blood and they're gonna smear it on the doorposts. So the two upright pillars in the door, they're gonna take it, smear it there, and then put it on the lintel, which is kinda like a, a header. It's the top beam of the door. They put that on the outside, right? Because it, it's a sign, it's for sign, a sign for someone who is going to be coming through Egypt. It's quite a gruesome picture. This is not the shepherds off in the field killing the lambs and then bringing the meat back and doing all the dirty work out in the field. This is very up close, this is very personal. This is a meal, a meal designed for sacrifice. That's what these animals are. They are not just a meal. These are valued offerings to the Lord. So the Passover was a meal of sacrifice. Not only that, the Passover was a meal of preparation. Look at verse eight through 11. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs they shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened and your sandals on your feet and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. It's a meal of sacrifice. This is a meal of preparation. They are to eat it in such a way that they are ready to go when the Lord says, get up and go. When the Lord's deliverance comes, they must not be in a position of waiting. They must be prepared. They must be ready when the Lord shows. Because when the Lord shows up, there is no opportunity for preparation. Preparation has got to be made now. Brother Bruce, I talked to a man just the other day in my, in my driveway. Not a man who's going to church. I asked him, I said, where, where are you and your family going to church? And he said, well, I'm not a religious man. I, I grew up that way, but I've, I'm not that way anymore. I said, well, I said, my family and I, I said, our whole life is about that. Our whole life is about the Lord. Our whole life is about our, our church family. I said to me, I said, listen man, to me, if what I do in this life is going to matter for eternity, then what I do about eternity must matter the most. And so I, I, I've got to be prepared now for that. This is a meal of preparation. In much the same way, the Israelites are being taught to be prepared. Listen to all the things that the Lord instructs them in this meal that would direct them to be ready for their salvation. He says in verse eight, they shall eat the flesh that night, that night. They're not gonna wait. And how do they eat it? They eat it roasted, roasted on a fire. And notice the ways that they are not allowed to cook it. Verse nine, do not eat any of it raw, why not? Well, because you're not pagans. You're not idolaters, you're not gonna eat this food with the blood in it. That's what the Egyptians do, that's what the Canaanites do, and you are not going to be like them, you're going to be distinct. But that's not the only prohibition. Do not eat it raw or boiled in water, but roasted. It's interesting when you, when you think about these means of cooking. Don't eat it raw because you'll be like the pagans. But don't eat it boiled, why? Well, if you eat it boiled, that sure is a slow way of cooking it. If you eat it boiled, you gotta have a pot, you gotta have certain utensils, you gotta have all these things out that are gonna need to be cleaned after you cook it. That's not a, that's not a very hurried way of cooking. Roasted, on the other hand, you just make everything out of wood, stick it over the fire, and after you've eaten it, dump it all in the fire and just burn it. There's no cleanup. You just burn it all, you destroy it. You're not keeping anything for tomorrow. You are being prepared for your deliverance because your deliverance is coming now. So he says, roasted on the fire with unleavened bread. Why unleavened bread? 
Well, we could, we could go from here and start tracing out these veins throughout Scripture, how leaven represents sin and other portions of Scripture, and sin permeates everything. We need to take out the leaven of the Pharisees, and so on and so forth. But that's not the reason here. The reason that they're told to eat unleavened bread is because if they put the yeast inside the dough, what do they have to do? They gotta wait. They gotta wait to let it rise, and they don't have time to wait so keep the leaven out. Keep out anything that is going to delay you. When you are looking for deliverance, put aside everything that will delay you. Just cook the matzah bread. Cook the unleavened bread and the bitter herbs. Why bitter herbs? I'll tell you why bitter herbs. Two reasons, and they're both connected. Bitter herbs because the bitterness reminds them of their slavery. It reminds them perpetually of their affliction. I don't think anybody would have ever enjoyed eating these bitter herbs, and they eat them in perpetuity every first month of the year. And that's the point. Eat something that is going to remind you of your affliction. It reminds you of your bitterness. You know why I think they're also instructed to eat bitter herbs? You think any of those Israelites were gonna chew those bitter herbs for a long time? I don't think so. I think they're just gonna chew it up and swallow it like you do with broccoli, right? You just chew it up, swallow it, and make mom happy or find a way to give it to the dog. But you don't sit there and leave it in your mouth. So bitter herbs, they shall eat it. Verse nine, do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roasted its head with its legs and its inner parts. Don't even take the time to disassemble the animal. Just cook it. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Why? You're not going to have time to pack this up. You're not going to have time to carry this with you. And by the way, you're going to have to go ahead and start learning the lesson of trusting the Lord for daily bread. So don't leave any of it until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. So after it's roasted, everybody's ate their fill. Kick out the sides of that spigot and let everything fall in the fire and just burn it and consume it. And this is how you shall eat it. Verse 11, with your belt fastened, with your robe picked up between your legs and tucked into your belt, your loins girded and your sandals on your feet. No time to even strap those on. And your staff in your hand. Do you ever find that when you get ready to go to church, you get ready to walk out the door, everybody has forgotten something? Get in the car, we're leaving in 30 seconds. Everybody gets in the car, everybody unloads out of the car, everybody gets back in the car, oh, I forgot this, and get back out and do it again. It's just mind boggling So the Lord says, no, put your belt on, gird your loins, put your sandals on, get your staff in your hand, and eat with the other hand. You just sit there ready to go. Don't get out any utensils, don't get out a pot to boil it in, nothing. No, you shall do what? You shall eat it in haste. Eat it in a hurry. It is the Lord's Passover. You are waiting for your deliverance, and you don't have time to delay. You don't have time to engage in anything that is going to cost you time. You don't have time to engage in anything that's going to distract you. And yet we engage in all sorts of things that distract us. We engage in all sorts of things that would tangle us up and keep us from pursuing the Lord and for looking towards our deliverance. Maybe we should learn some lessons about preparation from the Passover. Not only was it a meal of sacrifice and preparation, the Passover is a meal of substitution. Look at verse 12 through 13. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt. That word strike is the word nakah. It is the same word that is used to, to speak of what Moses observed from that Egyptian taskmaster who was striking that Israelite slave. Striking so as to kill. 
What does Moses do? He steps in and he defends the man rightfully. He does the righteous and the just thing. Now the Lord says, I am going to step in and the ka, I am going to strike so as to kill, strike the land of Egypt. In fact, all the firstborn, verse 12, all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and on all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. The Lord has prophetically through Moses promised this destruction, this catastrophe already to Pharaoh. Exodus chapter 11, let me read that for you, verses 4 through 6. So Moses said, that is to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, about midnight, that is in the deepest dark of the night, when you're not prepared, I will go out into the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on the throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill, and all the firstborn of the cattle, the behemoth, all the livestock that is. There shall be a great cry throughout all the land of Egypt, such as there has never been, nor ever will be again. And the Lord says, I will execute my judgments on the gods of Egypt. This is what the Lord has been doing the entire time. He has been mocking their gods. I'm not go through each one of those first nine plagues and how they're a mockery of this ancient Egyptian paganism. We've done that at some length in the past. But here now, what are, what are the Egyptians, what would they be hoping? Well, in all of their obeisance and all of their offerings and all of their sacrifices to their gods, they would hope that at some point their gods could deliver them. But their gods are not going to be able to deliver them. And they're not going to have cries of worship. They're going to have cries of, of great grief and of mourning when the Lord brings about his judgment. Numbers 33, three through four describes it this way. On the day after the Passover, the people of Israel went out triumphantly in the sight of all the Egyptians while the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn, whom the Lord had struck down among them. On their gods also the Lord executed judgments. Have you ever seen that picture in your mind? That when Israel was walking out of the land, what were the Egyptians doing? They were digging holes in the sand and there were bodies everywhere. No royal mummification process, not enough coroners. Just gonna bury them all in the sand. Bury them all even probably in a shallow grave. You can imagine the Egyptians, they were devastated. The Israelite slaves have not lifted up a sword. In fact, they were sitting in their houses with their shepherd's staffs in their hand. They didn't even go outside of their homes, and yet the Lord defeated their enemies. Didn't even raise a sword. I don't even know if they owned a sword. So the Lord executed his judgment on all the gods of Egypt. Isaiah 43, 11 probably describes it best. When the Lord says, I, I am the Lord, and besides me, there is no savior. But look at how this meal is a meal of substitution. The blood, verse 12, shall be a sign for you. It's not a sign that they look at to remember it's a sign that stands for them. It's not a sign for them to look at and remember. It is a sign that stands for them. It shall be a sign that represents you, that is for you. How do we know that the Lord means that? Well, look at what he says. And when I, verse 13, when I see the blood, it's not about the Israelites seeing the blood, it's about the judge 
seeing the blood. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you. When I see the blood, no plague will befall you. So what is the sign? What does the blood mean? The blood means that a death has already occurred. In this home, a death has already occurred. And this death stands for me. And what does the righteous judge do? He passes over them, not because of the death of a firstborn, but because of the death of a lamb without blemish, a death that stands for them, a death that stands in their place. And what does the Lord see? The Lord sees not their firstborn, the Lord sees their substitute. And the Lord passes over them because they are no less deserving of the wrath of God than the Egyptians are. It's just that the wrath was poured out on that innocent lamb. This shall be a sign for you. It's a meal of sacrifice and yes, a meal of preparation. It's a meal of substitution. This lamb is dying, not so much so that they can eat it, this lamb is dying so that they can continue to live. It's a meal of substitution. Not only that, it's a meal of proclamation. A meal of, well, pardon me, a meal of remembrance. I'm not gonna get ahead of myself. It's a meal of remembrance. Look at verse 14 through 20. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations as a statute forever in perpetuity with, with an indefinite time period. You shall keep it as a feast. So the first time that the children of Israel observe the Passover is because God's judgment was passing through the land and these people needed a substitute. That is the first observance of the Passover. All of the other observances of the Passover, is that because the angel of the Lord, the destroyer, is passing through the land? It's not because of that. It's a meal to remember. It's a meal to remember. So he says, you're gonna do this throughout your generations. It's a statute forever, verse 14. You shall keep it as a feast, as a festival, as a, as a, a party of, of sorts, as a celebration. Seven days, verse 15, you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall remove leaven out of your houses. For if anyone eats what is leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel, either put to death or put outside of the people of Israel, never to be welcomed back. If that person can't take the deliverance of the Lord so seriously that they set aside the things that delay them, they have no portion with the people of God. They don't understand the Lord's judgment. They don't understand the deliverance of God. They don't understand the necessity to rid oneself of sin. They have no portion with the people of God. They are to be cut off from Israel. Verse 16, on the first day you shall hold a holy assembly. Everybody gets together, a solemn assembly. And on the seventh day, a holy assembly, two Sabbaths. No work shall be done on those days. But what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared for you or by you. And you shall observe the feast of unleavened bread. For on this very day, I brought your hosts. It's a ba is the word there. I brought your hosts, your hordes. That word is used elsewhere many times to speak of armies. It's an army of freed slaves, an army of despised yet delivered shepherds. 
On this very day, I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statute forever. Verse 18, in the first month, from the 14th day of the month at evening, you shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person will be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is a sojourner or a native in the land. They have no excuse. If they are a part of Israel, if they've traveled into the land of Israel and they've become part of the people of Israel, though ethnically not born of Israel, they are still required to behave as the people of God. And there's no excuse for them. Wherever you come from, you become part of the people of God, it is expected of you to behave as a child of God. Do you think that's a truth that's transferable to us? That's a truth that's transferable to us. No matter when you came into the church, no matter when you got saved, when you were born again, you became part of the people of God, what are you expected to do and be? You are expected to behave just like every other child of God. Whether you are here for a long time, you're a stranger, a foreigner, a sojourner, it's the same expectations. Verse 20, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places, you shall eat unleavened bread. Repetition for clarity. The Israelites have no excuse. They cannot say that's too difficult to understand. It's actually very simplistic. It's not the difficulty of understanding. It's the difficulty of obedience. Now look at verse 21 through 28, not only a meal of sacrifice and preparation and substitution and remembrance, a statute forever, this is a meal of proclamation. And I want you to see where the proclamation of God's deliverance begins. See where the proclamation of God's deliverance begins. Verse 21 through 28. Then Moses called all the elders of Israel and said to them, go and select lambs for yourself according to your clans and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, these reeds. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and touch the, the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until morning, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the doorpost, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Either you are covered by that substitute and that sign of the blood, or you are not. And if you don't have faith enough to stay in that house and you even say, well, I've got good intentions and you step outside the house, surely the Lord knows my heart. Surely the Lord knows I have a good excuse for violating his commands. Surely he understands me. I can step outside of the boundaries that he set for me. Moses says, on behalf of the Lord, do not step outside the blood. You step outside the blood and your fate will be the same as the Egyptians. You see, the angel of death, the destroyer, by virtue of what's being commanded here of the Israelites, you recall that after the third plague, those, those remaining plagues, they only came upon Egypt. They did not come on the land of Goshen. The 10th plague comes on the land of Goshen as well. The other plagues, Israel didn't have to do anything. They didn't have to be filled with faith. They didn't have to be obedient. They didn't have to do anything. But the 10th plague is going to test them. Will they be obedient? Will they have the faith to follow through on the Lord's demands here? 
It says, none of you shall go out of his door until the morning. Why? Well, the Lord's gonna pass through. Strike the Egyptians. Verse 23, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. Now, I believe, I'm not gonna go into a long explanation here, but I believe that the destroyer is the Lord Jesus. The reasons to believe this in other passages, this, this person equated with the angel of the Lord, the same angel of the Lord in Exodus chapter three, verse one through six, that spoke to Moses at the burning bush, through the burning bush, and what did that angel of the Lord say of himself? It says, I am the Lord. He proclaims his name to Moses. He doesn't say, don't worship me because I'm an angel. He actually tells Moses, take your shoes off, Moses. You're on holy ground. The Lord is the one who is carrying out his judgment and his wrath on Egypt, and he'll carry it out on Israel too if they're not prepared. Verse 24, you shall observe this right as a statute for you and for your sons forever. And when you come into the land that the Lord will give you, as he promised, he made that promise in Exodus chapter three and then in all the other passages about Abraham, he says, when you come into the land the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall keep the service. Here it is. And when your children say to you, what do you mean by this service? You shall say, it is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For he passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when he struck the Egyptians, but spared our houses. You know what that is? That's a first gospel kind of proclamation. The kids are looking up and saying, Mom, Dad, Why'd y'all just kill that lamb? You brought it in the house. It's been in here for four days. We liked it. Why'd you kill it? Why are you putting blood on the door? What are you doing? Why are we eating these bitter herbs? Why don't we have our shoes on at midnight? Why are we wearing our belts? Why aren't we laying down in our beds? Why can't we do any work? What's going on? And what are the parents required to do? Tell your kids about the deliverance of the Lord. Tell your kids. Because what you're going to do is going to look so strange to them unless they know the Lord spite, the Lord killed the firstborn of Egypt, but the Lord spared us. He did this all these many years ago, son, and this is why we are safe. This is why we are saved. This is why we're delivered. Where does proclamation of the Lord's deliverance begin? It does not begin in the church building. It begins in your home. It begins in your home. It always has. This was Adam's great failure. Adam is there with his wife in the garden and the the thief comes in, Satan comes in and says, did God really say this? What did Adam fail to do? Adam failed to proclaim the word of the Lord in his home. And because of that, his wife and all of his granddaughters have pain in childbirth. His sons all sweat and die after the labor of their life. And everyone goes down to the dust because he failed to proclaim the gospel in his home, failed to proclaim the truth. Now here in this meal, this Passover, we see that it is a meal designed for proclamation. Psalm 78, two through eight says it like this. I will open my mouth in a parable. Think about this, fathers, make this your pledge. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old, things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from, our ch from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders that he has done. He established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children, 
so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast, whose spirit was not faithful to God. Preach the gospel to your children so they don't turn out bad. That's really what that passage says. This is the design of the Passover. This is the design of the Lord's Supper. Mom, Dad, why are we eating bread and juice in the church? Well, son, it's because I'm bad. And God is so gracious to me. He sent his son Jesus to die for me. He had his body broken, his blood poured out, and I'm saying that sacrifice is needed for me. Son, don't be bad like me. Don't be hard-hearted against God. Look at what he did for you. This is what we're told to do in Psalm 78. This is the design of the Passover meal. And I'll tell you, that's the design of the Lord's Supper as well. How do the people respond? Look at the second part of verse 27 and verse 28. And the people bowed their heads in worship the same way they responded when the Lord promised deliverance in Exodus 4. Then the people of Israel went and did so. As the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 28 of Moses, it says, by faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. The Passover is all of these things, a meal of sacrifice, preparation, remembrance, proclamation, you know what else it is? It's a meal of participation. It is a meal of participation. How did Moses observe the Passover? By faith. What did he believe? He believed that without the sacrifice of that lamb without a stain, that his life would not be spared. He believed that without obedience, he would enter into the judgment of God. Even Moses, even Moses who had performed these plagues in Egypt, Moses knew that he would not be spared without a substitute. Three quick observations about how God spares his people. Observation number one, God's people are spared his judgment by sacrifice. God's people are spared his judgment by sacrifice. This sacrifice there in the Old Testament, in, in, in the Passover, this is why the Israelites were spared. The sacrifice in Genesis chapter 22, when God provided a lamb to take the place of Isaac, this is why Isaac was spared. The sacrifice of that animal that gave up its blood and its skins to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve, this is why Adam and Eve did not die there in the garden. God's people are spared his judgment by sacrifice. And all of those deaths, all of that shedding of blood points us to the one sacrifice that would top them all, that would satisfy God's wrath forever. And that's the sacrifice of Jesus. How does God spare his people judgment now? He spares his people judgment by the perfect sacrifice of his son Jesus who had his body broken, his blood shed for us on the cross. My sin is nailed to the cross. This is what we just sang about. My soul is healed by the blood. God's people are spared his judgment by sacrifice. Not only that, God's people are spared his judgment by faith. They're spared his judgment by faith. These Israelites were required to do something. And this is what faith is. Faith is the kind of belief that always results in action. This is why baptism, not walk in the aisle, baptism is the display of faith. That is the public profession of faith. You believe in the Lord, you've got to believe enough to actually come into compliance with his commands. And this is how God spares his people, through faith, through sacrifice. Observation number three. 
God's people are spared his judgment by grace, by grace. Notice, as I said at the very beginning of our time, notice what is not in the passage. What is not in the passage is this offer or this instruction being given to Egypt. Were the Israelites less sinful than the Egyptians? Then why is it that the Israelites were given this offer of grace to be received by faith, why were they given this offer? God chose to be kind to them. God is faithful to the covenant he made to Abraham, even though Abraham's a sinner too. God was gracious. This is how God has always spared his people. The, the, the sparing of judgment for God's people has always been brought about by this kind favor from God this unmerited, undeserved love and favor from God. The Bible, as I said, through the Passover, prepares our hearts, not just for deliverance, it prepares our hearts for Jesus. Isaiah chapter 53, verse seven through eight, prepares us to look for one who would come in the likeness of a lamb. In his behavior, he would be much like a lamb. Listen to this, Isaiah 53, seven through eight. Speaking of Jesus, the prophet said, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people, so one who would behave like a lamb, who would be stricken as a substitute for others. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, the apostle Paul says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Christ is our Passover lamb. He is the spotless lamb of God. Who, who else could be a substitute for us? Lambs haven't done it for anybody. Lambs did not take away anybody's sins. They continually made those offerings. But Jesus is our Passover lamb. Now, as I said, when you look at the Passover meal, all of these things that I've said to you about the Passover meal are actually true about the Lord's Supper. As I said, the Lord's Supper is a meal of sacrifice, a meal of preparation, a meal of substitution, remembrance, proclamation. Listen to how the Apostle Paul teaches the Lord's Supper to the Corinthians. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you. That's Paul's way of saying, thus says the Lord. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, meal of sacrifice, he took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. It's a meal of substitute. This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. It's a meal of remembrance. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's a meal of preparation to make these people ready to meet God by bringing them into an agreement with him, an agreement of peace. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, a meal of remembrance. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a meal of proclamation. It's a meal of teaching. It's a meal that teaches the gospel. Now let me ask you, when your kids, your grandkids, when your friends, when other people say, what are y'all doing? What are you doing with that bread and that juice and that strange ceremony? What are you doing? You know what to tell them. 
let me tell you about how God spared me. Let me tell you how God sent a sacrifice for me. Let me tell you how God told me, you gotta believe. And let me tell you how kind and gracious God has been to me. This is the purpose of the Passover, prepare us for Jesus. This is the purpose of the Lord's Supper for us even now. Well, it's true then, God spares his people by sacrifice, faith, and grace. Would y'all pray with me?